Okay, so here we are, uh, Matthew uh, chapter, or not chapter, but lesson number 13, Matthew for Beginners, our last lesson in this particular series. If you're using your Bibles, open them to Matthew chapter 26. That's where we will read from Matthew. The title of this uh, particular lesson, From Passover to Communion, and we'll be discussing narrative number six. Okay, so, so far what has happened, Jesus uh, has uh, finished his public ministry. He's indicted the Pharisees for their disbelief and their hypocrisy. He's pronounced judgment on the nation and prophesied concerning the destruction of Jerusalem as well as his own return, the second coming. Um, he now retreats to be with his disciples for their final hours together before he will, of course, be arrested and tortured and crucified and buried and uh, resurrected. So Matthew continues to tell the story in this last narrative, always being careful to demonstrate how the features of Christ's life are in accordance with you know, the Old Testament prophecies concerning the life and the death uh, of the Messiah. Remember, Matthew wants to show that Jesus is the Messiah according to the word, according to the scriptures, which was very important um, to his readers. He's, he's writing primarily for, Jewish, uh, for a Jewish audience. So um, as we have seen in Matthew's gospel, there's a, you know, there's a certain order and sequence that he lays out his material. I'll show you that one more time. There are the narratives, there are six of those. An orderly telling of events taking place in Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, uh, of course, there's dialogue within these narratives, but the narrative sections are used to kind of move the action along. You know, he said this, he did that, he went here, he talked to this person, he performed that miracle, you know, the narratives, okay? Then there are five discourses. Uh, and as I've uh, mentioned before, the narratives are followed by discourses. Very interesting the way Matthew lays out his work, right? Yeah, narrative discourse, narrative discourse in that particular um, uh, in that particular order. So the discourses are where Matthew records the various teachings and conversations that Jesus has with his followers, with individuals, even with his, uh, his enemies. So I've demonstrated that Matthew's gospel, as I mentioned, has six narrative, five uh, discourses. In this last lesson of our series, we're going to look at the key part of his sixth and final narrative uh, and the part that I want to look at uh, is the Last Supper. But before we do that, let's review briefly the main events described by Matthew in his sixth narrative. So we have, first of all, the final hours that he has with his apostles. Uh, Matthew 26, beginning in verse one, all the way to verse 56. Several key events take place. Uh, during these final hours, uh, he's anointed by the, uh, by the woman uh, with the costly uh, perfume uh, in preparation for his burial. Uh, uh, Matthew describes the betrayal of Judas. Uh, he also describes the Passover meal and then the institution of the Lord's Supper or communion as we call it today. And uh, we're going to really focus in on that and I'll get to that in a moment. And then of course, Matthew describes the time of prayer and Jesus' subsequent arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then there are the two trials, uh, the trial before the Jewish high priest Caiaphas and the trial before Pilate. Now, the other gospel writers mention Jesus before other Jewish leaders as well as King Herod, but Matthew only mentions two trials, two of these, one before a Jewish leader and one before a Gentile leader. Then of course he goes on to describe the crucifixion and the burial and then the final main event uh, in the sixth narrative. Uh, Matthew describes the resurrection and then finally the great commission uh, to the apostles. Now I believe that we're familiar with these events but since we only have a certain amount of time left in this last lesson I'd like to really focus in on one particular event in this final narrative, and that is the Passover meal that Jesus was sharing with His apostles, at which time He instituted the Lord's Supper. 
And I, I, I want to do it this way because I, I believe that we, we know very well the story of Jesus' death and His resurrection and the great commission that He gave to the apostles to make disciples of all nations. But the Lord's Supper is something that we still do today. And I'd like to explain the how and the why it was begun. So we begin not with the Lord's Supper, but we begin with the Passover, which is the meal that Jesus was sharing with His apostles. And I'd like to look at the origin of the Passover meal. And in order to do this, we need to go back to the Old Testament and back to the book of Exodus. So very briefly, I'm going to just summarize this story for us. I'm not going to read all the passages. The story of the Passover begins, uh, as I mentioned, in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. The Jewish nation had lived in Egypt for 400 years. And by the end of that time, they had been enslaved by a cruel Egyptian king or pharaoh who was afraid that their great numbers would overrun his nation. During this time, God appeared to Moses and commissioned him to lead the Jewish people out of Egyptian slavery and resettle them in a land promised to their ancestors centuries before. The land, the promised land, promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You know, uh, uh, Moses was to be the one to lead the Jewish people into that promised land. So when Moses went before the Pharaoh to ask for the release of his countrymen, uh, the king refused and oppressed them even more. In response to this, God sent many plagues, 10 of them to be uh, uh, exact, uh, on the Egyptians as a punishment for not releasing the Jews. But the king stubbornly refused to give in to God's will. And so the final plague, or the 10th and final plague, that would eventually force Pharaoh to give in was the sending of an angel to kill every firstborn Egyptian child and animal, but spare the Jewish children and uh, animals belonging to the Jews. Now this protection of the Jewish people was based on their careful obedience and behavior on the terrible night when the angel of death would pass through the land. So this is what Moses explains in the book of Exodus in chapter 12, and we'll read a, a portion of that passage beginning in verse one. He writes, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to make one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So, true to God's word, on that fateful night, the angel of death passed through every home and field, taking the firstborn child and the firstborn animal to the horror of uh, the Pharaoh and his people but not a single Jewish person or animal belonging to them were harmed, was harmed. So completely defeated and afraid, the king released the Jews 
and Moses led them out of the country where they had lived for four centuries. Now in the following passage, Moses recounts how this great event in the history of the Jews was to be memorialized by a special feast to be celebrated each year. So we continue in Exodus chapter 12. We pick it up in verse 23. It says, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as He has promised, you shall observe this rite. And when your children say to you, what does this rite mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when He smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And so in the spring of every year for the next 1400 years, the Jews celebrated the Passover. For seven days before the actual meal, they would make sure that there would be no trace of leaven or fermentation in their homes, since these had the negative connotation of worldliness and, and, and decay. And the Passover was to renew their sense of purity and dedication to the Lord who had saved their nation with mighty deeds. Now, in this picture here, you can see the look of a typical Passover meal during that era. A table and items that would have been present when Jesus, for example, a good Jew, and his apostles, all Jews themselves, would have gathered for the last Passover meal that they would have eaten together. So they were Jews and they were celebrating, they were continuing, if you wish, to celebrate this Passover uh, meal that had been instituted by Moses uh, some 1400 years before. Now, every item on the table was filled with significance and history and function for their culture and their uh, religion. For example, um, uh, the low table and the cushions you know, that we saw in the previous image. You know, there's a famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper showing Jesus and the apostles you know, sitting on chairs with Jesus in the middle and the apostles you know, on either side. Uh, a marvelous painting, a marvelous picture, but the placement and the table and so on and so forth is incorrect according to Eastern custom uh, of the time. The table, more than likely, was U-shaped. Okay? It was low to the ground. And the men, because men ate separately from the women, the men reclined on cushions that were on the floor. And they sat on the same side, if you wish, to permit service, you know, servants to come and uh, replace the food on the table. Now, if you notice in this diagram, the first position on the extreme right-hand side was for the host. And then to his left was the honored guest or the leader. The host sat first in order to protect and serve the honored guest. And then to the left of the honored guest was, um, uh, were the rest of the, of the diners. And they were seated in proportion to their importance and their relationship to the honored guest. Now, from accounts in the Gospels, we learn that John was next to Jesus since he rested his head upon the Lord. We read about that in John chapter 13, verse 23. So he must have been seated to Jesus' left with Peter on the right, acting as host and leader of the apostles. So originally, you, know, you, you, you have John and then Jesus and then you know, Peter and so on and so forth or you have Peter and Jesus and John, and so on and so forth, okay? So we know this uh, because there's an argument, right? And we learned that um, uh, Peter and John were the ones who were sent to set up the meal. And then later on, there's an argument as to you know, who is the most important among them. So it seems that they had taken the best spots, Peter and John, they go organize the meal, right? And what do they do? Well, they take the best spots for themselves. 
one as host and one seated right next to you know, the Lord. And then everybody else you know, seated around the table with Judas uh, being put last because the, he was you know, not liked by the others. They knew what he did and, and not necessarily the, uh, the, being the traitor, but you know, that he was a thief and he was uh, untrustworthy and so on and so forth. So this caused some jealousy and some strife between uh, you know, the apostles. Imagine they're saying, well, who do they think they are? How come they took the best spots next to, to Jesus? Now, there's an interesting theory um, that goes like this that after this dispute and grumbling, Peter, in his kind of impulsive way, switched places with Judas to calm things down. And if this happened, if this is the way that it happened, then this would explain two things. First of all, it would explain how Jesus was able to hand Judas a morsel of bread in order to show who the traitor was. I mean, for him to be able to hand him the bread personally means that Judas, Judas must have been seated next to him in order to do this. We read about that, not in Matthew, but actually in John chapter 13. And the fact that Peter you know, would take the last spot in the back would also explain why Peter was the last uh, to have his feet washed. He would have, you know, to have been sitting in the furthest position. We read about that as well in John. So just a little bit of information about the seating, how they took the meal, um, the disposition of the table, and so on and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about the food and the drink, very significant. Uh, there have been many additions made to the uh, original Passover meal that was first eaten in Egypt. At that time, the Jews had the meat from the lamb, representing the sacrifice you know, made to save them and the unleavened bread as a symbol of their haste in leaving the land of Egypt, along with the bitter herbs, you know, usually some type of mixed greens, uh, the bitter herbs as a reminder of their bitter experience of slavery. Now this was the basic meal that they had when they were in Egypt. By Jesus' time, many centuries later, there were several items that were added to the meal. Uh, there was still the meat and there was still the unleavened bread and there was still the mixture of greens referred to as the bitter herbs. But now there was also a sharing of wine, actually four cups uh, by the time of, uh, of Jesus, if you wish, which represented the good life and the blessings that they enjoyed in the promised land. The idea is the adding of the wine to the meal was symbolic of the you know, the goodness and the blessings that they had uh, in the promised land. And each cup represented something uh, specifically. The first cup, sanctification. The second cup, uh, rejoicing. The third cup, redemption. The fourth cup, uh, thanks, thanksgiving. Uh, and each of these cups, there was a blessing that was offered. And so the blessing for their, their separation as a special nation, a second blessing of rejoicing, uh, a third blessing uh, 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 you know, focusing on the redemptive work of God, you know, saving them, a fourth blessing giving thanks. Now, we know that since at the Passover there was no leaven or fermentation that was permitted in the home, the wine that they drank was new wine or maybe even grape juice, which had little or no alcoholic content. One of the reasons why when we take communion, you know, you, we, we take the new wine, we take the grape juice. Now, in later times, the Jews added other items to the meal to symbolize you know, other uh, uh, Jewish religious significance, but the supper that Jesus and the apostles shared had these basic elements. Uh, perhaps also there was a bone or shank, if you wish, from the animal itself to represent the sacrifice that they had made in order to have the meal. Now, the meal itself had a particular order. Uh, in normal circumstances, the father or the head of the household would preside over the meal. He would uh, take a cup and he would offer a blessing and the others would follow suit. And then he would dip the bread into the meat and into the bitter herbs and he would eat and the others would uh, follow his lead. And so this eating and drinking and offering of blessings would continue until the four cups of blessing and the food would be consumed completely. Now, 
during this process in a, in a regular family setting, one of the children would ask the father what the meaning of this meal was. And this set the stage for the father to recount once again the great story of redemption experienced by the Jewish nation from the Egyptians by the powerful hand of God. So the meal was a, a true meal, but it was also an opportunity for teaching and remembrance and you know, reminding the people uh, of their uh, religious history. So this was the order and the nature of the meal that Jesus was having with His disciples when three extraordinary things happened. Matthew recounts two of them and John the other one. So the first thing that takes place is the lesson of the towel. And John is the one that talks about the lesson of the towel. So we're, we're going to leave Matthew for a moment and go over to John to, you know, to get a more complete picture of what takes place. And we read in John chapter 13, beginning in verse five. It says, then he poured water, he being Jesus, then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I do you do not realize now, but will understand thereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Now, according to custom, according to the custom of the times, the owner of the room had left a bowl and a towel and a pitcher of water so that the guests could wash their feet before entering the room for their meal. Now in normal circumstances, a slave or the youngest person you know, in the family would do this chore. Uh, and it was done as a courtesy for his master's guests who were cleaned, who were cleansed and refreshed you know, after a long walk. Remember in those days, you know, they, they walked on dusty roads, uh, they wore sandals, it was hot, they come into the house which is clean, Today, you know, we wipe our feet on a rug. In those days, you know, a slave or the youngest person in the family would do the courtesy of washing and wiping the person's feet as they entered the house. Now, I mentioned before that Peter and John had taken the places of honor next to Jesus. And an argument arose over the issue of each apostle's importance, probably because of, of what John and Peter had done. So this attitude probably explained why no one's feet had yet been washed by the time the meal began. Imagine it in your mind, if you wish. Each apostle walks in, sees the water and the towel, but refuses to lower themselves to washing their own feet and certainly were in no mood to wash each other's feet. And so they were, you know, they were the chosen apostles. They were men of importance. They were certainly above this common task. And so Jesus, knowing the divisive and destructive nature of pride, resolves this issue by lowering Himself beneath all of them, and He provides this service to each of them, that the true nature of discipleship is service, not position. And this was the lesson of the Tao. Now, you know, we don't wash feet today because it no longer is a sign of courtesy and hospitality. And of course, with modern footwear, it's not necessary. You know, we, we do other things, right? We do other things. And as far as discipleship is concerned, we continue to humble ourselves in mutual service in the name of the Lord. Now, this is done, of course, in, in many ways and situations, you know, as we volunteer our time and talents in serving the church, serving our community. But one particular way to lower ourselves in humble service, of course, is to give a portion of our wealth to the Lord for His use. You know, sacrificial giving, the type that makes us less wealthy than we could be, is, I believe, the modern way to watch each other's feet. It's the modern way to become less so someone else who has a need can become more. You know, many times our pride is usually attached or expressed through our wealth 
And when we sacrifice some of our wealth to serve the Lord, we're truly humbling ourselves before God and our fellow Christians. And I, I think that may be one of the reasons that the offering is usually collected before or after the Lord's Supper in many churches. It's a, it's a form of humility. We give up part of ourselves. We give up something very important to ourselves in order to so, uh, serve the Lord. Okay, so we go back now to Matthew's narrative for the second event that takes place at this time, and that is the revealing um, of the false disciple in Matthew 26. Let's read that passage. It says, now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12 disciples. As they were eating, He said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to Him, surely not I, Lord. And he answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. So after the washing of the feet, the meal continues you know, in its normal course. And everyone, having been uncomfortably silenced by Jesus' act of humility, imagine, nobody's got anything to say now. So it's at this quiet moment that the Lord reveals that there's a traitor among them. So they're mortified to hear this, and immediately they begin questioning Jesus. In Mark 14, Mark tells us that all of them asked Jesus if they were the one and Jesus replied nothing. Luke in chapter 23 says that they even whispered among themselves, questioning who the traitor might be. Matt, in the passage that we've just read, explains that Judas, even Judas, asked Jesus directly, and the Lord replied, you have said it yourself, which is a Hebrew way of saying, what you say is what you are. You said it, you know, that, that type of thing. You know, the inflection is what it gives it meaning in our day and age. But it's left to John, the uh, gospel writer John, seated next to Jesus to tell us that after Jesus exposes him, Judas leaves the room and seeks out the Jewish officials in order to offer his help in, betray in betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So after his departure, the group continues with the Passover meal, able to truly enjoy it now that Jesus has removed the final leaven of impurity with the removal of Judas from their midst. So Judas' departure sets the scene for the third important event of their gathering that night, and that is the institution of the Lord's Supper. And we read about that in chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. Matthew writes, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my kingdom. And so they're nearing the end of the meal with only one cup of blessing, one cup of blessing remaining, and one piece of unleavened bread to share. And it's at this point that Jesus changes the direction and the meaning of the meal from something which looked at the past to something that was going to look to the future. The bread without leaven will no longer represent the holiness and the purity that the people should have, but will now represent His holy and pure body given for them as a sacrifice for sin. The fruit of the vine will no longer represent the blessings and abundance of the promised land, but rather will become a symbol of His blood, His life, freely given in order to bring the blessings of forgiveness to all men. There will no longer be a lamb to sacrifice and eat in remembrance because the perfect lamb of God will be offered once and for all 
and will be an acceptable sacrifice for all men forever. And I, I want to pause here to kind of emphasize an idea. You have the purest of life. Before you just had an animal that didn't have a broken leg or wasn't blind or whatever that you offered you know, without blemish. But now you have not just a, a, a life, you have the perfect life, the perfect human life. Jesus as a human being, the, the, the divinity expressed as a human being has lived a perfect human life. And then you have uh, a, 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 a divine nature uh, in that human life. So what does that equal? Well, the pure life means that sin can be removed. You know, the, a pure life is offered in a payment for an impure life. Now, if Jesus was only human, okay, let's just say that He was only human. So He was a human being, but He never sinned. Let's just say He managed to do that. Well, he could offer his life, one life, one human, one perfect human life for one other life, one to one. It could be for Peter the apostle, or it could be for his mother, it could be for John, you know, but one perfect life to, you know, to take care of the sins of one other imperfect life. But the fact that Jesus also had a divine nature means that his perfect life, the essence of it, okay, was worth more than a simple human being. In other words, the value of his life equaled and outnumbered all of the people that ever lived. So you have a perfect life which is capable of offering itself for the sins of mankind and a divine nature which gave it a value to enable that sacrifice to be payment for all of the sins of all men, all time. So there will no longer be bitter herbs as a memory of suffering because the memory of Christ's suffering will be eclipsed by His glorious resurrection. And no one will have to ask what these things mean each, each year at this time because the good news will be preached every day and every hour until His return. So this is Jesus' last Passover, but it will also be the apostles' last Passover as well, because from now on they and all disciples after them will remember this night and share the bread and wine as a reminder of their freedom from slavery of sin and death to the glory of eternal life through the offering of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ the Savior. A perfect life offered for sin, a divine life powerful enough to pay for the sins of everyone, not just one person. And so Matthew will conclude his eyewitness account of Jesus' final hours, his crucifixion and the resurrection. And so these are the darkest hours of mankind. The Lord wrestles in prayer in a lonely garden spot while His apostles lay back in weary sleep. Judas appears to betray the Holy One and the Lamb of Life is led away like a common criminal to be falsely accused and condemned to die a cruel death on a Roman cross. And so the harsh dawn rose to see the Son of God labor up Golgotha's hill the burden of men's sins on his bruised and bloodied back. The Roman soldiers, skilled in death, quickly mounted this despised Jew on his cross between two criminals, satisfied that their work was nearly done for the day. There was some amusement for the crowd as the people and the chief priests taunted the suffering Savior and heard him cry out to the Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And shortly thereafter, Matthew says that Jesus yielded up his spirit. All that was left was to dispose of the body, which, to their surprise, was claimed by prominent Jews, saving the guards the trouble of carrying the dead man to the common grave where all criminals were buried. And so he laid there three days, cut, scarred, pierced, battered, and bruised, awaiting the glorious outcome for which men and angels had hoped for 
since the beginning of time. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for He has risen, just as He said. Come, see the place where He was lying. Go quickly and tell His disciples that He has risen from the dead, and behold, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see Him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to His disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of His feet and worshiped Him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw Him, they worshiped Him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. <laughs> 